Isaiah announced God's coming to a people exiled in a broken and parched wilderness. He declared that God's redemption would make a highway in the desert and change through rough places into plan. God would come as a shepherd, feeding, leading, and cradling the weary flock. This Advent, we seek such a God, this morning we light the candle of peace. Uh, o come, O come, Emmanuel. Well, good morning and welcome to online worship here at Colonial Heights United Methodist Church. We're glad to have you with you today on this first Sunday of Advent, as we have already seen from the lighting of our first Advent candle. Uh, we want to welcome you to this service and we want to remind everyone that tonight is a special joyful sound of Christmas event in our sanctuary uh, that's going to involve uh, different uh, styles of music as well as a nativity play led by the children in our church. So uh, we hope that you will join us for that uh, tonight for that event. Um, we also want to thank everyone for participating uh, this past week in Christmas caroling. Uh, there are some pictures from that in just a few moments that we'll show, as well as the uh, wonderful event that happened thanks to uh, many in our church, the uh, Advent by Candlelight, which kicked off. And over 200 uh, folks came out um, and were served by many of the men in the church. And uh, we want to thank Susan Arnold uh, for being the speaker and also The Hills Are Alive uh, for providing the music. And uh, just all of the uh, hostess that uh, provided table decorations um, as a special way to begin the season of Advent together. So um, we look forward to continuing to do more ministry as we enter the season and as we prepare for what is to come. We anticipate uh, what is to come as well. As we get started this morning, let us open with a word of prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for bringing us here today and the opportunity to worship you. Help us as we enter this new season in our church to have a sense of anticipation, but also a sense of preparedness. And what does it mean, Lord, that you call us to stay awake, to keep awake? Help us to live into that and to live each and every day uh, thinking and knowing that it could be our last, but knowing also what that means for us and what it means for those around us. Help us, Lord, this season of Advent to uh, acknowledge uh, one another, to think about uh, the ways that we might fall short of living uh, the priority that is following Jesus in our lives each and every day. Bless us now as we come into this time of worship, praying the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth and to the ends of the earth. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at a cock crow, or at dawn. Or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I was 15 years old, I couldn't wait to get my learner's permit. And I told my mother to take me to the DMV right away so I could take the test. And she suggested that I need to pick up a copy of the study guide and read it before I took the test. And I told her, I said, no, I know how to drive. And I walked into that test completely unprepared. There were questions about statues and laws I never even heard of. And it was a humbling experience to walk out of the crowded DMV with your mom saying, I told you so. When I was in college, I attended an international youth conference on evangelism near Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. And I packed a lot of shorts and t-shirts and I packed very few pants and maybe a long sleeve shirt or two. And the August time in Tennessee is very different than August in Rio de Janeiro. Someone told me that I needed to pack warm because it's in the Southern Hemisphere. And I, well, didn't listen. So what did I do? I froze the entire week and I pretty much wore the same clothes every day. You know, there's nothing worse than facing a test or a situation or a life event and being unprepared especially when the warning is right there in front of you. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus is leaving the temple in Jerusalem after some pretty provocative statements, some teaching that's challenged the people, and he comments on the, the grandness of the temple while the disciples are walking with him outside the temple. They talk about what a grand building it is and how the stones were so large. And Jesus says to them that, yeah, not even one of those stones will be left upon one another. And Mark doesn't even need to record a, a response here from the disciples because we know they were speechless. By the time we get to verse 24, Jesus has moved the conversation up to the Mount of Olives, which is a mountain that overlooks Jerusalem. From that area, you can look and see just about anything. It's still one of the great views of the city today. He's already told them to be on alert, to be ready. And he quotes the prophets Joel and Ezekiel about a day that's coming where the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give light and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And at that time, the people will see the Son of Man, he says, coming in clouds with great power and glory. All of this sounds like Jesus is talking about the end of the world. It surely sounds like that to me. And the end time, well, as Christians, we don't always understand what that means. And oftentimes we spend a lot of arguments and looking at scriptures and they're not always clear. But one thing we can agree on is that as Christians, we proclaim that Christ died, Christ rose again, and Christ will come again. So as the disciples are sitting there and they're listening to Jesus talk and they can see the city, they're overlooking those magical, majestic buildings. They can hear the sounds of the city the animals, the crowds of people. They can see the burning of fires from the sacrifices in the temple. 
They can smell the smoke coming from the, the temple and from around the city. They can see all the events unfolding right there before their eyes. And Jesus wants them to imagine something completely different. An event when the Son of Man, Christ, Jesus, God's self, comes again and everything will change. So what are we to do about it? Well, for one thing, there's nothing we can do to stop it. It's going to come. There's no amount of prophecy or biblical algebra that we can do to predict it. Our task is not to predict or even fear it. Our task, and Jesus makes it quite clear in Mark's gospel here, is to have one task, and that is to be ready, to be awake. Now, Jesus tells the parable about a man who's going on a journey, and he puts his slaves in charge while he's gone, and each slave has a different role. They don't know when the master's going to return. All they know is that they need to be ready. They must be prepared. And that's us. We need to be ready. We need to be prepared. So if I ask you today, what are you doing to be prepared for Jesus' return? What would you say you were doing? Are you staying awake? Are you keeping alert? You might ask, but pastor, how do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. You know, I think about what Mary Anderson writes when she talks about where do we place our attention and our priorities? Just how awake are we? She says that when Advent begins, as the leaves fall from the trees and the earth goes brown and bare, the church contemplates the end as well. The end of our lives in death and the end of the world with Christ coming. She writes, what would you do if you knew that you only had one month left to live? Would you finish up an important task at work? I don't know. That doesn't sound very good. Would you travel to a place you always wanted to go? Maybe. Would you pray more? Would you go to church more? Would you do more generous acts? Would you find ways to leave a mark on the world, a legacy? Maybe you'd reconcile a fractured friendship or relationship. If you answered yes to any one of these possibilities, she writes, we indicate that in our last days, what we're really saying is we'd be better stewards of all things, better than we are now. Now, if that's true, and I think most of us, it probably is, if we knew we had that few time, few moments left, that we would live our lives a little bit different. So really, what Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 13 is that we need to live our regular days as if we are living our last days. And that means we need to be ready. It needs to be effort, consistency, anticipation, because the next moment may be our last. So I think for many of us, we know what we need to do. We know what we should do, decisions we know we should or shouldn't make. But our mantra often becomes, well, I'll do it tomorrow. That's something I'll worry about later. Maybe that sounds like your life. It certainly sounds like my life sometimes. I'll just do it tomorrow. But in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, I think Jesus was getting at that when he tells his disciples about worrying. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. For Jesus, there's a danger for the church when we focus too much on tomorrow and not enough on today. Because we can be in preparation in the moment, in the day. So we need to get up each and every day with a mindset of, what if today was my last day? What would we do? What would we do to prepare? What would we do to stay awake? As a church, we need to also help one another. We need to be ready for Christ's return, especially when people face trials and tribulations and temptations. We need to be there. We need to be present. That's not something we wait for tomorrow. We don't wait until Christmas morning to start decorating our Christmas trees or to buy presents for friends or families. We prepare. So we should also be doing the work of preparation in our spiritual lives. Even though Jesus says no one will know, we do need to be ready. First, it starts with ourselves. There was a young woman who was asked, how she found time for Bible study in her life. She replied, pre-arrangement. They said, what do you mean? She said, I manage to go to the gym. I take the children to school. I take them to soccer practice. I make dinner. 
I look at my own Bible study as a support group, a regular appointment with God's grace. Therefore, she says, I make it a priority as if I'm keeping an appointment with Jesus. But secondly, this idea of preparation and being awake goes beyond just ourselves. It goes to our community of faith. As a community, as Colonial Heights United Methodist Church, we can work on our preparation. And I think the church is at its best when we do these things. There's a lot of strong ministries of preparation out there. I think about the uh, some tangible things. For instance, here at this church, we'll occasionally collect uh, cleaning buckets for people in need when there's a disaster, especially a flood up in Kentucky or Virginia. And we'll pack those food, those flood buckets and then we'll send them off. And someone once asked me, they said, isn't it a little too late to be sending these flood buckets two, three weeks after the flood. I mean, the houses have already molded. It's kind of a little late. But you see the ministry that UMCOR has for the flood buckets, for example, when there's a disaster response, the, the, the cleaning buckets and the flood buckets that we collect in the present are being ready for the, are being prepared for the future. That's right. The cleaning buckets that have gone out in the present have happened because of the last disaster project. So there's a lot of preparation involved in this. And I also think about, it's beyond just mission. Look at our children and youth ministry right now. It's something I'm very excited about here in this church. Children and youth ministry in many ways is a ministry of preparation. Uh, I'll give you an example. Tonight's nativity play, we're expected to have over 40 children involved in the play. Isn't that incredible? I celebrate that, but I also know the children and youth need to be and continue to be a priority of the ministry of this church. Every one of our children and youth are going to face uh, spiritual challenges, matters of faith, in which they're going to need that preparation that the church can help provide, that love and support and encouragement to remind them that God and God's love is with them. We as a church can help our young people stay awake by continuing to make children and youth ministries a priority. So let's think about other ways that we can be prepared, right? Ways we can stay awake uh, as individuals and also as a church, because soon it's gonna be 2024. That's right, we blinked and here we go. It's almost the year is up. Soon we'll blink and our children will be adults. They'll be leading the church soon. Our children will have children. Our grandchildren will have children. Perhaps sooner than we think. And in the words of Isaiah, we better stay awake because the Son of Man will be coming in clouds with great power and glory. We better stay awake. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again.
Joy to all. 